special train arrived one day, and the fire controller welcomed the passengers. They looked at everything in the yard and photographed the engines. Buck's driver let some of them ride in his cab. They're the railway society, his driver explained. They've come to see us. They're engine city of Truro. He was the first to go a hundred miles an hour. Let's get finished. Then we can go and talk to him. Duck on. He's too famous to notice me. Rubbish, said his driver. Come on. Duck found City of Truro at the coin stage. May I talk to you? He asked shyly. Of course, smiled the famous engine. I see you are one of us. I tried to teach him our ways, said Duck modestly. All ship shape and swindon fashion, that's right. Please, could you tell me how you beat the Southwestern? So City of Troll told Duck all about his famous run from Plymouth to Bristol more than 50 years ago. They were soon firm friends and talked Great Western till late at night. City of Troll left early next morning. Good riddance, grumbled Gordon, chattering all night. Keeping important engines awake. Who is he anyway? He's City of Truro. He's famous. As famous as me? Nonsense. He's famouser than you. He went a hundred miles an hour before you even drawn or thought of. So he says. But I didn't like his looks. He's got no dome, said Gordon darkly. Never trust domeless engines. They're not respectable. I never boast, Gordon continued modestly, but a hundred miles an hour would be easy for me. Goodbye. Presently, Duck took some trucks at every station. He was cross, and it was lucky for those trucks that they tried no tricks. Hello, called Edward. The famous city of Truro came through this morning. He whistled to me. Wasn't he kind? He's the finest engine in the world, said Duck. And he told Edward about City of Truro, and what Gordon had said. Don't take any notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. He thinks no engine should be as famous as him. Look, here he comes now. Gordon's boiler seemed to have swollen larger than ever. He was running very fast. He swayed up and down from side to side as his wheels pounded the rails. He did it, I'll do it, he did it, I'll do it, he panted. His train rocketed past and was gone. Edward chuckled and winked at Duck. Gordon's trying to do a city of Truro, he said. Duck was still cross. I think he'll knock himself to bits, he snorted. I heard something rattle as he went through. Gordon Schreiber eased him off. Study boy, he said, we aren't having a race. We are then, said Gordon, but he said it to himself. I've never known him ride so roughly before, remarked his driver. His fireman grabbed the brake handle to steady himself. He's giving himself a hammering, and no mistake. Soon Gordon began to feel a little queer. The top of my boiler seems funny, he thought. It's just as if something was loose. I better go slower. But by then, it was too late. They met the wind on the viaduct. It wasn't just a gentle wind, nor was it a hard, steady wind. It was teasing wind, which blew suddenly in hard puffs and caught you unawares. Gordon thought it wanted to push him off the bridge. No, you don't, he said firmly. But the wind had other ideas. It curled around his boiler, crept under the loose stone, and lifted it off and away into the valley below. It fell on the rocks with a clang. Order was most uncomfortable. He felt cold where his dome wasn't. And besides, people laughed at him as he passed. At the big station, he tried to wheeze them away, but they crowded round no matter what he did. On the way back, he wanted his driver to stop and find his dome, and was very cross when he wouldn't. He hoped the shed would be empty. But all the engines were there waiting. Never trust domeless engines, said a voice. They aren't respectable.